Getting President Biden on the Ohio ballot in November ahead on Face the State. While state lawmakers worked on a legislative fix to do that, the National Democratic Party made a major move of its own. How it officially sets the stage for Ohio voters to have a choice between both major party candidates for president. Also, guilty on all counts, a jury convicted former President Donald Trump on all 34 counts in his hush money criminal trial. I'll talk with University of Cincinnati political science professor David Niven about what both big developments mean going forward in the race for president. Plus, recreational marijuana sales and new rules for selling the drug are now officially in effect in Ohio. Dispensary owners say they're ready to go. in the state of Ohio that Joe Biden will be on the ballot because they are going to go in an alternative direction to find a solution that does not include the Ohio legislature. A long fight to get President Joe Biden on Ohio's ballot is now over. The Democratic National Committee is getting around relying on state lawmakers altogether by nominating their 2024 presidential candidate virtually. Thanks for joining us for Face the State. I'm Doug Petcash. This is something we've been following closely for the past several months, when Secretary of State Frank LaRose first warned Democrats about the deadline issue. It all surrounded this year's Democratic National Convention, which is set to happen days after Ohio's August 7th deadline to certify the ballot. That meant the convention had to either move up or state lawmakers had to pass an exception for Biden delaying the deadline. Lawmakers worked on a legislative fix all week in a special session called by Governor Mike DeWine. But the DNC decided to take a different approach. By holding a virtual roll call vote, they're able to nominate Biden before the Ohio deadline without worrying about other options. It's not clear when the roll call will happen, but it is expected in the weeks following June 4th. In a statement, Democratic National Committee Chair Jamie Harrison says, quote, through a virtual roll call, we will ensure that Republicans can't chip away at our democracy through incompetence or partisan tricks and that Ohioans can exercise their right to vote for the presidential candidate of their choice. Lieutenant Governor John Husted is also weighing in on the recent effort to get President Biden on the ballot. He says everyone deserves to have both candidates on the ballot, but thinks it's already clear who will win in Ohio in November confident that Donald Trump is going to trounce Joe Biden in this election. Uh, and uh, but I want to make sure that it's fair. We want everybody to have a chance to make their voice heard for their preferable candidate. And uh, and and Governor DeWine is going to make sure that that's the case. Meantime, another major development in the race for the White House. A jury found former President Trump guilty on all 34 counts in his hush money criminal trial. Trump was charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in a scheme to illegally influence the 2016 election. He was accused of using hush money payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Trump becomes the first former president to be convicted of felony crimes. He faces possible prison time when he is sentenced on July 11th. That is just four days before the Republican National Convention. Trump is expected to quickly appeal that guilty verdict. Well, there's a lot to break down in these big developments in the race for president. So let's bring in our expert right now, University of Cincinnati political science professor David Niven. David, thanks again for being here. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Well, first of all, just you know, starting with former President Trump's situation, what do you make of you know, a former president actually being convicted of felony crimes? Well, the one word that goes along with everything Trump is unprecedented. You know, the nature of his campaign in 2016 was unprecedented. The nature of the presidency, unprecedented. The nature of the weeks following the election of 2020, unprecedented. So, you know, this is the culmination. Obviously, he has four different, you know, uh, criminal cases against him right now. This was the first to make it inside a courtroom, mm -hmm. and this was the first to produce a conviction. And it's the state one, and the others are federal, I believe. So what does this mean, though, for his campaign? going forward? Well, I think the biggest thing this has meant 
to this moment is it's interrupted his ability to control the conversation. He runs a campaign very much on the notion that he can decide what the topic of the day is. And this has really brought him down in terms of his ability to shape conversations. He's been, you know, he's been on the receiving end of a, you know, of a topic chosen and imposed on him. You know, his typical supporter, you know, sees him in a way that he can do no wrong. So this is going to reinforce that base who's going to see him. That he's a, under attack. That he's under yeah. attack, that he's a victim, that he's their victim. Certainly that's how he's going to portray himself. But here's the problem for him. Every state primary, there's been significant votes for Nikki Haley, even when she dropped out. Those are Republicans who are not entirely comfortable with Trump. And a 34 times convicted Trump is not more appealing to those Haley voters who he needs in November. Uh, that was going to be my next question was the base will stick with him. Right. We're seeing people doubling down and putting their support behind him. But it is those voters who are maybe unsure of which way to go. Um, you know, right. haven't made up their minds yet, whether they voted for him in the past mm -hmm. or not. Well, those voters who are unsure, those voters who have Trump fatigue, those voters who you know, maybe thinking about the practical realities because this is one conviction. It doesn't, it's not the last court case. This is not the last time he's going to sit before a judge and jury in all likelihood. So, you know, the practical realities of a presidential candidate who is facing sentencing, as you mentioned, in July. Just four days before the uh, Republican National Convention. Does the campaign also, uh, and, and, and its impact on the convention, depend on that sentence that, that comes down? Because they, they talk about there's a chance for prison time, but it's highly unlikely. I mean, the range of possible sentences is everything from probation to home confinement to prison. You know, I think typically in New York, a case like this is, is a m rather minor penalty, but typically you don't have 34 counts. You know, you don't have the, you know, the guilty on 34 different counts. How does President Biden address this? Right now, so far, at least as of like Friday morning, he hadn't said right. much. I think the opportunity for President Biden is to really tell the story of what he's been working on and to really do, in effect for America, a split screen. You know, while Donald Trump is over here, you know, worrying about prison time, I'm building bridges. You know, while Donald Trump is in here dealing with judges and juries, you know, I'm producing, you know, I'm going to work every day. And, and really, he doesn't need to talk about this. Everybody knows about it. You know, he doesn't need, you know, normally in a campaign, you know, you have to hype certain things, make sure people are thinking about it. Well, they're already thinking about that. So he really needs to present the contrast. Uh, switching now to the ballot issue here in Ohio, um, what's your perspective on the DNC making this move? You and I talked about it a month or so ago, uh, ma making the move to a virtual roll call before the in-person convention and therefore ahead of Ohio's deadline to make sure the president is going to be on Ohio's ballot. Right. Well, the number one thing is this is something the Democratic Party can control. They couldn't control the timing of the Ohio legislature. They couldn't control, you know, a potential court case. This is the one thing in their control. So it makes sense they made this move. And, you know, you can kind of think of it as, you know, that part of the Oscars where they hand out the awards that isn't on television. You know, this is going to be the part of the convention where they do the actual important thing, even though it's not going to be formally part of the convention. It's going to happen in advance. Do you think that this upsets delegates in the 49 other states that Ohio kind of forced the hand to take the, the official nomination? nominating process out of the in-person convention? Well, I think delegates understand that Ohio is a special case in, in American politics right now. But, you know, we saw what the DNC did in 2020 when they did a, a virtual, you know, components mm -hmm. of their convention, which was, you know, they did little mini celebrations of each state as it announced its vote totals, you know, for the presidential mm -hmm. nomination. And I would look to see something very similar where every state is going to have that moment where they're going to put forward, you know, their symbols, their sort of little mini celebration, even if it's only for a few seconds of their state's, you know, background. Now, they've made this announcement that they're going to do this, but they're not meeting until June 4th to, to f hammer out the rules and the process right. for it. Do you think that uh, there's a chance that, you know, depending on what the legislature did this week, that they would um, cancel that process? I doubt it. You know, I think they view this as an opportunity. You know, let's, we have a moment here to sell the president and, and to sort of take advantage of, of this circumstance that was forced upon us. Now, they do have to, to meet and they do have to vote and change their own rules. The so, bylaws, so, right, yeah, yeah, so there is a process, but it's in everybody's interest in the party to let that happen. And, you know, I don't think anybody would say, well, we can count on Ohio coming through, regardless of what the legislature might do. You know, I think at this point they're, they're committed to this path. How do you feel that this 
whole situation um, made Ohio look in, in you know in the eyes right. of the political world around right. the rest of the country that this couldn't be fixed quickly right. and easily. Well, you know, at this point in the Ohio legislature, they would have trouble organizing a two-car funeral procession. So it looks like a dysfunctional group. And here's the real you know problem for the Ohio legislature. Alabama had the exact same problem, literally the exact same problem. Their legislature quickly dispensed with it and unanimously approved an exemption for 2024 to put President Biden on the ballot. So Alabama was capable of doing this. Ohio wasn't. You know, back in the day in Alabama, they used to say, well, thank God for Mississippi. Anytime somebody said something bad about Alabama. And now the problem is states can say thank God for Ohio because relative to Ohio, their legislatures are functioning. So, um, Looking ahead now to November 5th, regardless of what the sentence is for the former president, do you still expect Trump to win Ohio fairly easily? I believe it was, what, eight points right. four years ago. The short answer is yes. The demographics of Ohio are very favorable to the Republican Party right now. And so, you know, Biden is probably, in 2020, as strong a candidate as the Democrats could have put up for Ohio, and it didn't matter. You know, it did not close the gap from 2016. You know, Ohio as a whole, you know, the demographics, it's, it's whiter than the nation, it's older than the nation. It is, you know, has a lower college education rate than the nation. You know, that's pretty well a description of a Trump base and it's, you know, a Trump based state at this point. You kind of touched on it at the beginning when you were talking about unprecedented, but mm -hmm. is this one of those moments where all of these things coming together, in particular with the, the Trump criminal trial conviction, where you just say, you know, we've never seen any like anything like this and we likely won't see anything like it again right in the middle of a campaign especially. Well, one can certainly hope. But you do you do look at the totality of what's happening in our, our presidential election and, and these events and you say if you wrote this, if this was a West Wing plot, you wouldn't believe it. You know, if you wrote this, you know, 10 years ago, this, you know, this would lack credibility, but it's what we're in the midst of and, you know, it's what Americans, you know, are having to wade through on a daily basis. And so going forward in the, in the weeks leading up to the uh, sentencing, uh, do you expect Trump to be out railing on the system and, and the witch hunt? Right. You know, I think this invigorates, you know, you know what's his, his, you know, rally theme going forward. You know, it's been the 2020 election for a very long time, and a lot of Republican, um, you know, pundits are very concerned about that, that he's too far looking in the past. And so this at least gives him, you know, a new, you know, a new, uh, uh, line of attack to say, you know, that this court case was was rigged against him, which, you know, he was already saying he's, you know, his allies were saying it within seconds of the uh, of the verdict. So it does give him some new material. And, you know, if, if you watch a Trump rally, they go on and on and on forever. So we can always use some new material. All right. Dr. David Niven with the University of Cincinnati. Thank you so much for your perspective today. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. All right. Now here's a look at the important dates for the general election. Election day is November 5th. However, military and overseas absentee voting starts September 20th. The deadline for you to register to vote is October 7th and early voting starts the very next day. Of course, we're still several months away, so don't worry as we get closer. We'll remind you of these deadlines. Coming up next, a deadly new drug being tracked right here in Ohio. Why state leaders say Narcan won't help people who overdose on this drug. And can you buy it yet? A look at the rules for recreational marijuana sales where they stand in Ohio right now. Welcome back to Face the State. The war on drugs in Ohio took center stage this week. This summit was hosted by the Ohio Narcotics Intelligence Center, or ONIC for short. It brought together law enforcement, crime lab specialists, and drug task forces to learn about the latest trends. It's a battle Ohio's top leaders say evolves every day. These uh, criminal elements and cartels are using technology. They're using social media tools to market their wares. Uh, to connect to customers, to keep out of the eyes of law enforcement. And so we need to use technology to continue to try to monitor and find uh, where the drugs are coming from. 
10 TV is uncovering a new zombie street drug now infiltrating Ohio's borders. It's already shown up in eight states and is blamed for overdose deaths in several cities. An alert just released from the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education shows this sedative is more deadly than xylazine. It's called metatomidine a powerful animal tranquilizer used on dogs and cats. But experts at ONIC say drug dealers are mixing the sedative with fentanyl and other street drugs to create a deadly cocktail. However, if a sedative like metomidine is present, um, that can complicate the life saving or the use of naloxone because uh, metomidine is a sedative and it's not an opioid, so it's not responsive to naloxone. This map shows the eight states where this zombie drug is showing up. Those yellow circles show clusters of overdose deaths in recent months in cities, including Chicago, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Ohio is taking another step toward recreational marijuana sales. New rules are now officially in effect for businesses applying for recreational marijuana licenses. That application process is set to begin Friday, June 7th. Meanwhile, 10 TV's Tara Jabor is hearing from local dispensary owners who say all that's holding them back is that license. Recreational marijuana is coming soon to downtown Columbus. I think that a lot of people are chomping at the bit. It's 2024, like people should be able to do what they want to do. Ohio voted yes for recreational marijuana back in November, and some people say it's taken the state a while to get things rolling. Everyone I know that uh, is, has been going elsewhere if they can't get it here. Medical dispensaries will be able to apply for a recreational license starting June 7th. Jason Arks with Sunnyside Dispensary says they've been preparing for an influx of sales. We're hiring additional staff. We're optimizing traffic flow in the store, uh, making sure that we'll have enough product when things are ready to launch. Sunnyside has three locations in central Ohio, Newark, Chillicothe, and Marion. Irk says he hopes to start recreational sales ASAP. Actually ahead of schedule. So uh, at the end of next week, the state will open up the application process for us to be able to apply. They'll be approving them uh, as they are submitted. The Ohio Chamber of Commerce is one of the groups who is outspoken about not wanting recreational sales. Rick Carfagna with the chamber says they have a lot of questions for bars and restaurants that have customers who may want to smoke marijuana at their establishments. It's still a controlled substance under federal law, and the Division of Liquor Control has already warned businesses that they could be jeopardizing their liquor permits by allowing use on their premises. Carfagna says they also want to see the tax dollars from recreational marijuana be put towards any potential issues that arise with recreational usage. You know, that's making sure that we, we have money diverted to law enforcement and that we have money diverted to behavioral health and recovery services. That was Tara Jabor reporting. The state of Ohio also announced a model policy for school districts to follow when it comes to banning cell phones in schools. The policy prohibits students from using phones or similar electronic devices on school property during school hours. It also requires students to keep their phones in a secure place, such as a locker, a backpack, or a storage area provided by the district. Districts can create their own policy. They have until next July 2025 to figure out a plan. Nearly $29.5 million is now going toward improving housing access in Ohio. The funding is part of the first round of the Welcome Home Ohio program. It will help land banks buy, rehabilitate, or build properties for income-eligible Ohioans. Here in central Ohio, Marion County is receiving about $30,000 for a property. There's a shakeup in Hilliard. The city council president decided to step down from her role as president after comments made several weeks ago about the Israel Hamas war. In the aftermath of the peace resolution that Hilliard City Council passed on April 22nd, there have been continued distractions during council meetings and within the community. I am concerned these distractions will have a negative impact on the city administration and staff in their day-to-day -day work to ensure Hilliard continues to be a shining community in Central Ohio. Cynthia Vermillion made the announcement during a special board meeting Tuesday night. Councilmember Les Carrier also spoke about her decision. Last meeting I indicated Council President Vermillion deserves some grace. Primarily because these roles for which we serve are not easy and we all make mistakes. Our community also deserves the same grace and the actions tonight by Ms. Vermillion demonstrate what that really looks like.
Vermillion will remain on city council as a council member. Vice President Tina Catone is taking over as president for the remainder of the year. Making an impact one library at a time. From the 60s up and through the 90s, you know, he was the preeminent Asian librarian in the Western world. Ahead, we'll introduce you to an Ohio man who some consider the father of Ohio libraries. We end today with the story of Dr. Huawei Li. His name is likely unfamiliar to most, but as 10TV's Angela Ann shares, what Dr. Li created during his time at Ohio University is being used by millions. Just a few miles north of Ohio University in Athens, many have wondered why two marble Chinese lions grace the entrance of this brick building. This is why. So the Huawei Li Annex is one of five depositories in the state. And Huawei Li made sure that we had a depository here in Southeast Ohio, which was a huge accomplishment. Janet Holmes says that's just a snippet of the contributions from the man who came before her. In 1978, Dr. Huawei Li started a two decade tenure as Dean of University Libraries. The Chinese American turned OU into one of the top 100 academic research libraries in North America. He also created Ohio Link, basically modernizing the days of card catalogs into a massive online library sharing system. It is still being used today throughout the Buckeye State. A, a user can easily request an item from another library. Um, that library will respond and ship that material to the next library or to the requester, right? And they get it within, you know. Days. I'm the youngest of six children. For Bob Lee, the man described as patient, warm, and humble was simply dad. It wasn't until, yeah, much later in my life that I realized what an impact he was making and, and uh, how well known he was all around the world. Yeah. <laughs> like the time his father was given the Melville Dewey Medal Award, the highest achievement for any librarian. Well, I think it's safe to say, like, from the 60s up and through the 90s, you know, he was the preeminent Asian librarian in the Western world. Dr. Lee passed away in December, but his footprints can be felt on five continents where he gave lectures, presentations and workshops, all while building a new generation of library leaders. He had established at Ohio University an uh, exchange program, so many, many librarians from the, from the East came through that program and even lived at our house sometimes. Uh, we had lots of parties where they all came over to our house and, and then they all went out into the world and, you know, lead libraries themselves now. When Dr. Lee retired from OU, it wasn't long. In 2003, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. asked Lee to serve as the Asian Division Chief, the highest leadership position of any Asian American librarian. He started to give them some, some names of people he thought would be good, and they're like, no, Dr. Lee, we want you to be the head of the Asian Division. So he became the first Asian to be the head of the Asian Division of the Library of Congress. A far cry from when Dr. Lee first came to America after fleeing communist China. I mean, he had nothing. I think he arrived with, you know, one suitcase and a few hundred dollars in his pocket and, you know, just scrapped for everything that he could get. Dr. Lee's legacy will likely one day join the depository annex that bears his name, a story so unique and worth preserving. And Dr. Lee had many other achievements, including helping OU become a member of the prestigious Association of Research Libraries. You can read more about his life and legacy on 10tv.com. Thank you for joining me this week for Face the State. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you back here next Sunday at 1130.